and to some degree, not all renewable energy has all those attributes, but that's the, the, the broadest definition of it. So what a lot of people don't realize is about 60% of our energy and electrical energy in, in Canada comes from hydro and wind. And uh, being in Alberta, we think it comes from coal and gas, which is kind of true uh, as far as Alberta is concerned, but not necessarily for the country as a whole. And we're, we're one of the largest hydro producers in the world, if not the world hydro, uh, largest uh, uh, hydro producers in the world. The hydro that I'm talking about is run a river hydro that is not the large dams and the large reservoirs that you see that have been built in the past 40, 50 years, but more of the run a river type of, uh, facilities that have been built in the last 20 years. So from a workforce perspective, I know you're all, you're all going to be entering the workforce sometime soon. There's some interesting things in the logistics workforce in that almost three quarters of the uh, workforce is going to be retiring within the next 10 to 15 years. And my stats are a little bit old here, but uh, it gives you an understanding of what, we, what some of our challenges are in the electricity sector and, and what role the renewable industry will play in the electricity sector. So as far as hydropower is concerned, that's our distribution across Canada. And you can see that Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the territories are still relatively untapped. It's not to say that we don't have the raw resource. We do have the raw resource. We just have not capitalized on it yet. The other issue is interconnection and import and export capabilities. And although the provinces do have some import export uh, capabilities between them, as well as north south, there are still gaps in the system. One is south of Alberta, and we are lacking a lot of east-west transfer uh, capabilities as well. And that is all about load balancing and balancing technologies and suiting the grid and the import and export capabilities amongst the various opportunities that we see in the various regional jurisdictions. The other thing is em emissions. And, and what we're seeing here is obviously uh, both small and large hydro, wind, geothermal, and solar are low in emissions in comparison to the other energy choices that we've had, we have right now. And this is a conscious decision that we have to make as a society as to whether or not we want to continue on in these paths or how quickly we want to tra transition if we choose to transition. The other issue is costs. And as we've seen over the years, renewable energy has dramatically dropped in cost. As a matter of fact, hydro and wind today are at the avoided cost of energy that is being created right now. We're doing a lot of the development work um, without uh, subsidization, and that needs to be differentiated between contract life and issues of that nature. I'll get into that in a little bit as I go through my, uh, the rest of my talk. You'll see that there is a, um, a genuine competitive advantage to renewable energy in comparison to traditional supplies. And we can evolve this way without it necessarily having a cost premium in the long term. But again, it's a matter of time frame. So what we've seen generally is a, from a society standpoint is going from doing things less bad to doing things that are more good, typical engineering English stuff. Um, the point is, is that uh, we, we, are, we are seeing a lot of transitional discussions about these kinds of things. We're not necessarily seeing it fully reflected in a lot of policies across Canada. There are some jurisdictions that are doing this uh, more on a trial basis or sometimes on a short-term basis, but there has not been a full-blown long-term commitment to this type of thinking in our policy networks. And there's a lot of talk, but not necessarily a lot of action. And you've heard some of these expressions before. You know, we, we didn't uh, get out of Stone Age because we ran out of stone. Same thing with the internal combustion engine and oil and gas. It's not a matter of commodity and supply. It's a matter of all the other attribute uh, choices that we want to make. But we do have a conundrum. And that is a chicken and egg kind of thing. Um, in, order, in order to have sustainable energy, you have to divide, design a sustainable market. In order to have that sustainable, and once you have a sustainable market, you can have a sustainable business. 
And, and, that, and that sustainable business will encourage sustainable manufacturing. And that also encourages sustainable edu education. And all of this is one big cycle. And unless we see some leadership and some vision in some of these areas, we're not going to accomplish this. It's a catch-22. And it, unless something moves, we'll never get into the area that we're, we're thinking that might be the best way to go. So what we have seen recently, and I'll use Alberta as, as an example, is accelerated pl pollution abatement. We have uh, you know, carbon um, uh, trading. We have uh, cap and trade uh, policies down in California. We, we've got a number of uh, um, penalty um, programs, such as here in Alberta, for uh, heavy polluters. And so we're seeing a lot of that kind of activity. And then you have some leading edge areas like in Ontario with the feed-in tariff program, things that, which are increasing the adoption of uh, renewable energies. But again, it's a bit of a patchwork quilt right now. It's not necessarily a co cohesive program that will allow a lot of major industry and, and, and um, uh, manufacturing to uh, take hold. So is there going to be a transition from fossil fuels to electricity-based economy? That's a very good question. And, and not, if so, how long is it going to take? Is it going to be a decade or five decades? What is it? Those are the kind of questions that are still out there today. And we need to figure out exactly where we're going and why we're going now. And whether or not we can afford to do this as a society and how fast we can afford to do this. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And talk about what, what goes on with the uh, with the development as we know them today. And basically, you have four four P's, if you will, to the uh, development cycle. You establish programs like the eco -Logo, eco logo program, things of that nature, the fit programs. You develop processes for regulatory approvals. And the problem with a lot of the things that we're doing in the renewable energy sector is that a lot of the regulatory departments, agencies, and processes that they, um, they hold have not been designed for re renewable energy. They were designed for a fuel-based or a pollution-based regulatory uh, um, scheme. And they're all about whether or not you're making incremental improvements to your pollution. When you come to a, uh, a regulatory hearing and, and you say that you have one ten millionth of the CO2 footprint of a standard coal-fired thermal plant, and it takes you 11 years to get approval in comparison to a coal-fired thermal plant at the exact same time taking seven months, you know you have a regulatory approvals process problem. And those, that's a reality that happened in Alberta, just that, that I lived through. $22 million to get approval on something that had that little of a footprint through a regulatory re a review process. So those are the challenges that renewable energy has, and those are the, those are the, the gaps of the the barriers to development. And unless you get that cycle working properly and effectively, you're not going to have a good uh, low-cost industry to uh, allow the development to move forward in a, in a reasonable uh, pace. <clears throat> so the other, the, so after you get through process, you build projects and you then have production. Each one of these have different time frames. Programs are in the order of uh, uh, election cycles, more or less. Um, pro processes are more like 10 to 20 year, decade period levels. Projects take a few years, usually uh, five to 10 years for development cycles. And then production goes on. In the case of hydro, some of the oldest plants I've worked on are over 100 years old here in Canada. Um, a good many of our projects are built for 40 to 70 years operation. So they, it's a pretty long time frame. So this is some of the projects that we've been involved in. Uh, my company's about uh, 13 years old now. And uh, we've done about $3 billion worth of renewable energy development across Canada. And we've uh, done about uh, a third of the wind, uh, a good portion of the hydro, and now getting into utility scale solar. And the the challenges are quite different across the region, even when you're going through the uh, regulatory process at the federal level under the exact same laws. You're